Hey students, it's Emily Poole. Let's talk about topic 4.3, the enlightenment. Students, if you've not figured this out by now, in these videos, I'm trying to give you literally just the information that you need with maybe a fun story or a fun fact thrown in in the shortest amount of time as possible. Your time is valuable, your attention span short. I'm trying to meet you where you're at, right? This video is going to be a lot because you need to know a lot. So buckle up, let's get right to it. Religion says that truth comes from God. The enlightenment says that truth comes from reason. In the same way that scientists and the scientific revolution were trying to figure out the natural laws that dictate the cosmos, enlightenment philosophers in the enlightenment were trying to figure out natural laws that dictate how and why humans should interact with each other. And it's intellectuals like Voltaire and Diderot who are the first to apply these scientific revolution-esque principles onto human society. We're gonna start this in England. Let's go back to the English Civil War. So the English Civil War happened. You wanna know who lived through that and was deeply affected by it? This guy named Thomas Hobbes. Thomas Hobbes said, Ew. in order to prevent anything like that from ever happening again, we need to surrender all of our rights and all of our power to one just ruler, who will rule over us absolutely. Hobbes was a huge proponent of absolutism and Locke, although also influenced by the English Civil War, viewed it very differently. Locke believed that, you know what, actually people are born with natural rights, life, liberty, and property, and it is the duty of the government to protect those natural rights. And if the government is not protecting those natural rights, in the case of the English Civil War, it is the duty, the duty of the people to overthrow that government and reestablish it with one that actually does protect the rights of the individual. Locke is advocating for revolution. He's literally saying, if the government isn't doing its job, overthrow it. This idea in general is radical and it especially was radical in the 16 and 1700s. What was at the root of this philosophy by Locke? The idea of a social contract. Students, we all have social contracts around us all the time, so don't overthink this. They can be written or they can be unwritten. Great example of a social contract in the United States is the U.S. Constitution. In living in the United States, we are agreeing to abide by the laws of the United States that are outlined in the Constitution. It is an explicit social contract, but there are also implicit social contracts like, I don't know, showing up to work wearing clothes. That's just like a thing that we do in the United States and in most of the world. And it is just a natural norm that we subconsciously, indirectly have agreed to. With that defined, looking back at Locke's idea of revolution, it is the duty of the government to protect the rights of the citizen. And if that social contract is not being met, overthrow. This idea of a social contract was also supported by this guy named John Jacques Rousseau, who actually, you know, wrote a whole book called The Social Contract. And I don't love Rousseau. I'm just going to say that right now because he believed that the women's only place in society was in the home. While all of these Enlightenment philosophers are like, ah, oh, yes, let's be learned. Let's be more involved in our political system. Rousseau's like, yeah, uh -huh, only if you're a man. But Rousseau says man is born free and everywhere he is in chains, which really just means people are free when they are governed by their own laws and not the laws that institutions place on them. Rousseau also disagreed with Locke on the idea of property because he believed that private property should be abolished because the earth belongs to no one. Rousseau and his social contract believed that people should strive toward the common good because serving everyone will benefit everyone. Combining those things together, your individual rights, your property rights are subservient to the general good of the population. Which, like Locke, is incredibly radical for this time in Europe. These new political theories drastically impact the world, not only European society, especially John Locke's idea of the consent of the governed, that the government only has the right to exist if the people deem it to exist. That goes directly against divine right and absolutism. For this next part, I'm just going to tell you some Enlightenment philosophers and tell you what they did. Baron de Montesquieu, like Locke, actually believed that absolutism was not the ideal form of government because too much power leads to corruption, so he advocated for a separation of powers. Cesar Beccaria, oh my gosh, I love him so much, was an Italian philosopher who wrote against torture. His book on crimes and punishment said, you know what, the punishment should actually fit the crime committed and shouldn't just be death. French philosopher Voltaire, which is a pen name, by the way, was exiled to England and spent, therefore, a lot of time in England during his formative years, and he was shocked by what he saw there. There was economic freedom and that the nobility had to pay taxes. There was religious toleration, unless you're a Catholic, and there was political representation of the people through elections. 
That is some insane stuff. And when Voltaire went back to France, he was like, you know what? France maybe is not not doing this well. Voltaire comes back to France and he writes like it's running out of time and his two main critiques, his two main targets were the Catholic Church and their power and the French monarchy and its power. And his critiques of those two institutions of power led to his multiple jailings, which then made him want to say, you know what? Freedom of speech is important above all else. I should be able to critique the government and I should not have to be jailed for that. Mary Wollstonecraft, because women are important too, was a female philosopher who said, you know what? Women only appear inferior to men because they lack equal access to education. And yes, Mary Wollstonecraft is the mother of Mary Shelley, who wrote Frankenstein, which you have probably read in your high school career. And the last one I'll talk about here is Denis Diderot. He was a French philosopher who believed that if people had access to all information, they would be able to critique accurately the things that are happening in society. It was Diderot's mission to compile all knowledge, all human learning into one book, the Encyclopedia. Diderot and his focus on the democratization of learning, giving learning to everyone. He is the internet of his time. He was the TikTok of his time. We love Denis. Students, I hope as I was sharing those names that you in your brain somewhere made a connection that these philosophers are from England and from France and one from Italy. And I want you in your class or with your best friend or with your little group chat right now to think about why that's the case. All of these philosophers are not just existing on their own separate islands. They are meeting together. They're working together. People are sharing their ideas. Where? In coffee shops. Coffee, the drug that aided the enlightenment. Much like it still aids you in your studies today, probably. And while women oftentimes were not directly involved in these conversations, women did host enlightenment salons. Think of it like a very smart, intelligent, classy dinner party. And the women, like Madame de Joffrin, were the ones who came up with the guest list and then got to sit in and listen with everything that was being shared. Outside of just political theories, there are also new economic theories that these Enlightenment philosophers are focusing on. Very famously, Adam Smith in his book, Wealth of Nations says, actually, mercantilism is not where it's at. Hard money is not the source of wealth, like these mercantilists believe, but rather it is land and resources. Physiocrats were the first to come up with these new economic theories, and Francois Quesnay believed that mercantilist policies by limiting and restricting trade were violating the natural laws of economics. So the Enlightenment, with its focus on reason, rationalism, empiricism, and skepticism, also changes religion and religious view in Europe. A lot of these Enlightenment philosophers advocate for more religious toleration, which again is just a radical concept for the continent of Europe at this point. But some of these philosophers, like Voltaire and Diderot, take it a step farther and develop new philosophies like deism and atheism. Deism is the idea that God is a divine clockmaker. There is a God that created the world and set it into motion, but then has since remained absent from human affairs. And atheism is the idea that there is no God. And it is these theories circulating in a post-religious war Europe that move religion from being a commonly discussed idea to a very private concern with like just you and your family. That was a lot. The Enlightenment, a focus on reason and rationalism, impacts political ideologies, economic theories, and also religion. If you need any help with any of those, you know you gotta check out my Ultimate Review Packet, which is always linked in the description below. Sorry, this was a little bit of a longer one, but to be fair, I did tell you that at the beginning of the video. And as always, students, you can do it. I believe in you.